everyone. How are you? Long time no see you. So, I'm starting the second season a little bit more with uh, more or less what I've been doing with the first one. So we will have some presentations about research. Um, I want to be a slightly more focused now on specific words. I will talk a little bit more about LLMs. I know, I know everyone's talking about LLMs. Why, why, why are you adding more? No, I mean, I'm doing research on this. So basically I just want to put a little bit of the things that I'm doing. So I also want to talk about tools. Um, if you have any tool that you would like to use or, or if there's something that you think that I might be using in my words that you would like me to, to talk about, I'm very happy to try. So just leave it in the comments, okay? If there's a topic or a tool or, or something that you would like to see and if I never obviously to do it, I'm more than happy to try, okay? So today we are going to talk about obfuscation. And basically, if you remember the, the malware videos, obfuscation is this concealment strategy that some software is using to hide intellectual property or hide the content of the software. So when you are trying to do reverse engineering, it's harder. And basically, the idea is that you won't be able to identify the different components of the software. Okay. However, however, the main problem of applying obfuscation is that you might break the security of your software. And that's what I want to talk about. How obfuscation is going to change the nature of your bugs. Hmm. But what happens if I don't have bugs? Everyone has bugs, so don't be proud. Okay. So this work uh, was something that I, I did with my colleague Guillermo. Um, we have been working on this for a while in the last few years. So basically, just to start a little bit about this word just to provide you a little bit of an introduction was obfuscation. So obfuscation is when you take the code of your program, you apply some transformations to the program and the program becomes unreadable. Actually here you have a small example of how the program has been shaped with a specific figure. I think in this case it's a kind of anime figure or something like that. And you can see that it's slightly difficult to read the program itself, but the program still runs. I mean, it's still compiles and still runs, the compiler understands the program, so basically the semantics are supposed to be exactly the same. In this case, that's easy because, you know, it's just a small program that has been reshaped, and if you shape it back, you probably have the original program. However, in other cases, it's different because sometimes you change the control flow, sometimes you change methods, sometimes you have changed how the data is handled, Sometimes you change arithmetic operations. Sometimes you add a virtualization layer under, um, under your program and you change the whole language. So basically, there are different things that are going to be applied during the obfuscation itself. And that's really good because it's going to give us a whole game about what we can do to the program to conceal it. But we are not talking about that today. Nonetheless, let's... Let, let, let's have a look to this small example about the obfuscation. So here in the left side, you just have a control flow graph of a specific program. And basically what I want to do is to apply different transformations to the program. So I can break methods, as I said, I can change the control flow, I can change the variable names, I can do a virtualization layer, etc., etc., And that will give me a complete new program that is totally masked with respect to the original one. So when you call your reverse engineering team, they will struggle to identify the different components of the program and the semantics when they are doing reverse engineering, which is good for protecting intellectual property, but for malware analysts. Okay, so in theory, obfuscations need to be semantically equivalent. And in theory, they are. The transformations are semantically equivalent, or many of them. However, is this completely true? Because we are always thinking in the context of a program, a program as a written program in terms of syntaxes. However, I prefer to think in the context of a process, a process that is in an operating system, is running, has its resources, memory, uh, files, etc, etc, you know all of this. So when you put the program, the process into the context, maybe the obfuscation that you have applied is modifying the semantics in terms of how the process is interacting with the system. And that's really important because that's going to change things. With things, the things that they're going to change are the bugs. What happens when my program has bugs or crashes? Okay, and that's what we are going to discuss today. So basically, some of the bugs are going to become reachable. 
Good. Some of them are going to appear, which is awesome. We are going to discover new bugs in our program just because we have obfuscated. Others are going to be masked. Whoops. So it's the opposite. So we are going to lose track of some bugs because they are masked. That's that's quite weird, no? Because I just obfuscate the program. Why am I losing some of my bugs? We will see that. And and the question is how this can be measured, how this can be actually used to say, okay, this obfuscation is better, this obfuscation is worse, this obfuscation works for this, this obfuscation works for this other thing. So basically, that's what we are going to try to answer. But before we go there, I just want to say the following, that is the main thing that I want you to take from this paper. Altering the control and data flow of a program can deteriorate the security of the program, okay? And basically, the resulting process, the, the resulting process in the operating system might be more vulnerable. And it doesn't matter if your program is not vulnerable when your process is, because the process is the leading thing, okay? So basically, some of these modifications, these obfuscations are going to introduce bugs in your program or are going to modify their nature. And here, I'm just providing you a small example of one of my favorite cases. So in this program, you have a loop, and you have an array that you're writing inside of the loop, okay? Basically, you are going to pass, during the, the, the loop iteration, you are going to pass the bounds of the array. But in the first program, there's going to be no error. The program is going to finish uh, correctly. However, in the second, there's going to be an error, okay? What is going to happen is that the program that you have right here is going to crash. Why that happens? Well, if you just compare both, of prog pro both programs, you will see that Basically, the only difference between both of them is that I changed the variable names. There's nothing relevant here. I mean, I just put Q1, Q2, blah, 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 to the variable names, replacing the original ones. So why is the program failing? So the real answer is because when I'm running this program, the first one, this variable that is controlling the loop, is going to be immediately after the array, okay? So basically what it's going to do is that once I pass the bounds of the array, I'm going to write the variable that controls the loop. And because of that, that's going to end the loop and finish the program correctly. However, in the second case, because the, chain, the, the, the variable names have, have changed, the compiler has put the variable before the array. So once I finish writing the array, when I pass the bounds, I will start writing in sections of the memory that I shouldn't be writing. So basically, this is going to create a segmentation fault, and this is going to unmask this specific error, okay? Something that might not happen with other test cases, but happens thanks to the obfuscation. So the obfuscation now is acting as a stability transformation, and it's helping me to identify this bug. How we are going to be able to measure this, how we are going to be able to discover this, so basically what we are going to do is to apply testing. And concretely, the testing strategy that we are going to apply, that is an automatic strategy, is fuzzing. So why fuzzing and not verification? Why testing and not verification? Let's, let's just take the critics of the verification people. So basically, the obfuscation is going to destroy any potential attempt to verify. You're not going to be able to verify your software because, you know, it's obfuscated. You cannot read it. Your software is not going to, to, to be able to read. The second one is um, that we want to understand the specific error that we are activating. We want to understand whether there's an illegal instruction, whether there's a segmentation fault, whether we have a floating point exception, etc. For that, we need to run the program in the context of the operating system, and the operating system needs to give us the error back. Last but not least, we want to cover the program, so we need a strategy that covers the system. Verification is not able to do it, we just said that. So we are going to use testing, a feedback-based testing, to be able to provide us back some information about the program execution. Okay, so what are we going to discover? Which bugs are we focused on? We are focused on crashes and exploits. What crashes? Segmentation fault, I'm writing in a section of the program that I shouldn't be writing. Illegal instruction, basically I just move the pointers in a way that is creating an illegal instruction for the uh, processor. I'm just trying to send an instruction that is not valid. Memory corruption, I'm correcting my stack, I'm correcting my heap. Floating point exception, division by zero, for example. I, we have a timeout for the programs to execute. So I'm reaching the timeout, the programs should be fast. So maybe the obfuscation is just 
making the programs slower. And finally, out of memory. My obfuscation is exploiting my memory, which sometimes happens. Then, what happened with the exploits? So with the exploits, we have different options, okay? This exploit has been discovered by heuristics, so they are potentially different in different contexts. But some of the examples that we have is destination and return address violation. Basically, you are trying to return for a function or just moving a jump to a destination that doesn't really correspond to you or doesn't really correspond to the function where you are supposed to return. This means that the person might be taking control of the uh, program counter. Okay? Run as access violations are basically the same, but with the branches, you're accessing a branch that you shouldn't be accessing. A segmentation fold on the program counter, so the program counter is going to a section of the memory that doesn't correspond to your process or to your specific process. A stack and heap corruptions, similar to the previous one, you have corrupted the stack to be able to write or read information that you shouldn't be reading. Okay, the same with the heap. And finally, bad instruction that is basically you have constructed an instruction that shouldn't be there, similar to the illegal instruction. Okay, and what's the interesting thing about this? Just a little bit of spoiler. When you obfuscate a program, this crashes, and these exploits, especially these exploits, as the spoiler, these exploits are going to change a lot. Okay, and just by applying the obfuscation. But we are going to see a little bit more about this. So basically, just to give you a little bit of notions about why we are using testing, why we are using fuzzers, some of the criticism is that Okay, but you are using fuzzers, fuzzers are feedback, feedback based, but obfuscations are trying to uh, conceal the, the structure of the program, so your feedback might be affected by that. So, yep, yeah, yeah, that's actually true. Obfuscations are supposed to deteriorate the control flow graph and make it ununderstandable. So, we are going to keep this in mind in order to be able to understand whether we are able to apply fuzzers or not. And between the metrics that we are going to create, to measure this phenomenon, we are going to incorporate a metric, just focus on this. So what is going to be our strategy? This is very simple. We are going to have programs, and we are going to have their obfuscated version. Okay? For each program, we are going to create a corpus or crashes that we have identified. For each crash, we are going to check which ones are exploits or not. The same with the obfuscation. Okay? So then, once we have the obfuscated crashes and when we have the original crashes, we are going to cross them. And basically, we are going to see how the obfuscated crashes affect the original program and vice versa. And with this information, we will be able to define different matrices. With matrices, first of all, we are going to define a matrix that is called file stability that is going to try to measure how difficult or how resistant our program is to fuzzing. Okay? This is going to be useful because if the obfuscation is making testing impossible, well, it's not worth it to try to obfuscate that, I mean, to try to test that obfuscation because it's not possible for us to know whether the obfuscation is adding or no security violations in terms of our specific approach. The second one is the stability of, sorry, the exploitability of the program. So basically, we have exploit, exploits that we have discovered and we want to check whether the exploits are also in the obfuscation and what's the rate of the exploits that remain in the obfuscated program. Okay, so basically that's going to be the exploitability. The third one is the stability. So we have a probability distribution of crashes between the different crashes that I just mentioned or the same with the exploits and we want to see after the obfuscation how this probability distribution is going to change. So if we have more probability to discover uh, floating point exceptions instead of segmentation faults after the obfuscation that's something interesting, that's something that we want to know because the nature of the bug is changing and so might be the nature of the program or the nature of the operations of the program. Imagine that you are manipulating arithmetic operations with, with your obfuscation. If you start to discover more floating point exceptions, maybe there's something that is wrong with your obfuscation itself. And last but not least, my favorite is the complementarity. So basically, this is going to measure how much the bugs that you have discovered in the obfuscation are new for the original program. And this means that the obfuscation is complementing your testing process, helping you to discover new bugs in the original program. So the obfuscation is working as a testability transformation. Okay? So you can imagine that the evaluation of this was not trivial. 
there are many things that we needed to evaluate and we did a very exhaustive work to try to understand all of the different notions. So first we start thinking about what happened with the feasibility, the resistance of the programs to the faster, and second with the exploitability, how many exploits were generated originally. Then we focus on the stability of the obfuscations themselves and also on the complementarity, just to know whether the obfuscation was helping as a testability transformation. Third, we check exactly the same, as in the second case, but with exploits, just to understand whether we were affecting the exploitability of the system or of the program. And last but not least, we wanted to know the transitions between the original program and the obfuscated one, and how, for example, a segmentation fault can transist to a floating point exception, or how a um, stack corruption can transit to a segmentation fault on the program pointer. So basically, these transitions are important because they help us to understand a little bit more about vulnerabilities and crashes with respect to the obfuscations that we are analyzing. Okay? So for the experimental setup, we use four different obfuscation engines. We use the LLVN obfuscation engine, Tigres, uh, Stanix, and CofusFax. We use two compilers, LLVN and GCC. We apply 20 different obfuscations. So between them, you have arithmetic manipulations, control flow manipulations, virtualization, change of variable names, uh, anti-analysis techniques, branch manipulation. You have a plethora of them. So there are many, 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 many of them. The experiments were huge. We use the American Fuzzy Loop as the fuzzer. It was the, the, the fuzzer number when we wrote the paper. Now it's FL++, but you know, things change. We can, update. We can change the, 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 the experiments. We uh, use 7,436 programs, but from these ones we only discover bugs in 3,739, okay, with the ones that had crashes, and in total we discovered about 646,000 crashes, which translated also in 198,000 exploits, okay? So basically this was the whole corpus that we have for our experiments, and to be able to understand how these metrics were helping to decide whether an obfuscation was good or not. So let's start with the results of feasibility and exploitability. So in terms of feasibility, we have good news. Obfuscations are not very resistant, okay? In the worst case scenarios, we were always able to identify at least four crashes per program, which is quite good, per program with crashes, I mean. In terms of the exploitability, we don't have good news, and we're not gonna have good news for the rest of the video, just to give you a small spoiler. So basically, as you can see here, uh, we can either reduce exploits up to 50%, which is what happened with the anti-analysis, uh, with anti-alias analysis, and in other cases we can increase exploits up to 27%, which was happening with the encoded of arithmetic operations. So you can see that the nature of the exploits is really, really fuzzy, and that's bad. That's bad because it means that the program might be more vulnerable in ways that you don't understand, because you cannot check what is happening when the program is obfuscated, because actually that's the reason of the obfuscation itself. Second, the stability. In terms of crashes, they are quite stable. In general, many of them are quite stable, but not all of them. So there are some examples, for example, like the anti-alias analysis, the anti -alias analysis or the manipulations of branches, that might not be that stable, but in general, the stability is quite reasonable. In terms of the complementarity, this is one of my favorite ones. So, in general, they are not very complementary. However, there are some, like the virtualization, that actually complements the testing. They are able to identify new bugs in the programs you are testing, and that's really useful, because that means that once you apply the obfuscation, you will be, in this case, the virtualization obfuscation, or the flattering of the control flow graph obfuscation, which is associated with the LLVM compiler, you will be able to identify new bugs in your original program. So, happy. We are very, very happy because of that, because we have identified, magically, a new testability transformation. Then, what happened with exploits? Okay, okay, let's talk about the stability with exploits. So basically you can see in this graph that the order of magnitude has changed. Um, basically, the obfuscations are not stable. It's not stable in terms of exploits. So they really, really 
uh, different in, in that aspect and that affects to almost every obfuscation. So, however, for the complementarity in order to identify the exploits, this is good because we are identifying more exploits thanks to the obfuscation itself. And actually this is increasing in order of magnitude. So basically for the case of the virtualization, we are able to grow a lot. In terms of the exploits, we are able to grow a whole order of magnitude with respect to the previous case, which is quite good. So we can use this to identify more exploits in our software. Okay? But there are bad news because the obfuscation is unstable, so they are going to change the nature of your exploits. So it's likely that someone will be able to exploit your program if you have a crash in a way that you are not expecting. Okay? And it might be difficult for you even to identify it. In terms of transitions, when we are talking about crashes, there are very, very few transitions. So just segmentation fall normally transits to any other uh, bug that you have, but that's normally because it's the, norm, the, 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 the most common crash in a software. So it's normal that it's the one that is going to transit with more probability. However, in terms of the exploits, we can see that there are three specific exploits that transit between them. These are the stack corruption on the PC, the destination address uh, violation, and finally, the segmentation fall on the program content. Okay, so these three are going to be the ones that are going to transit the most and they are going to be connected between them. If you think about it, it makes sense. So basically a segmentation fall in the program counter is that an accesses a section that doesn't correspond to me. And that happens a lot when I have a corrupted stack because I might be returning to a section of the memory that I shouldn't address. And at the same time, that's a destination address violation. So you can see that they are very well connected. So it kind of makes sense that they are going to transit between them. Okay, so just to conclude, obfuscating programs is very useful in terms of hiding the program, but in terms of bugs, you have to be very careful because you might be changing the nature. So basically, just to repeat myself, altering the control and data flow of a program can deteriorate the security of the resulting process, and these modifications introduce bugs in programs or modify, them, or modify their nature and severity. So I hope you liked the video. I hope when you use obfuscations, think it twice. If you want to check the paper, you just have it in the comments. And also, please, uh, if you want, just uh, follow me on Twitter. Just like the video, comment it. Comment it if you want me to discuss something else about obfuscations, about anything else, tools, etc. as I mentioned at the beginning. And if you can share it, I will really appreciate it. So thank you very much and see you in the next one. Thank you.